here. I'm the missions pastor, and I'm blessed to be able to do that and um, just share our heart on Chance for Change, what it is, why we have it, and what it's about. You know, uh, today is uh, mission is Pa Wednesday. You know, the first the first Wednesday of the month is we focus on the missionaries. For you who may be new here, we 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 uh, stop our verse by verse teaching through the Bible on that on the first Wednesday of the month and just focus on missions. And um, what I want to share tonight is. Uh, just what we're, why we're along the Thai Burma border, how, how this church ended up in that far location, what we're doing there, how God's using us, and how God is using chance for change and bearing fruit through that. And then after I'm done, we're going to break up into prayer circles and we're going to pray for our missionaries. Um, things for you guys who've only been here uh, post pandemic, this is kind of how it used to be back in the old days. Um, the circle here is for the Thailand Burma area. All the missionaries in, that are serving along Thai Burma are represented in that circle. Back there is Mexico. That back circle over there is England, and this is North Africa. And so typically what we do pre-pandemic is we, you know, we would get together, everybody break up into the circles, and they kind of commit to pray for uh, this certain area of the world every, every PA, every Pray Around the World Wednesday. And then with the pandemic, we kind of broke that up and you know, used a different format, but it, it seems good to go back to that, that, min, that method of ministry and prayer. So... Last month, uh, for Pray Around the World, the core group leaders, they did a wonderful job of just sharing the heart of the different missionaries that we have. And the encouragement was for you all to understand all the different missionaries in all the different areas of the world, so you could help decide which circle you want to sit in and kind of call home over the, the upcoming season. So that's what this is all about. But tonight, we're going to, as I said, we're going to share on uh, Chance for Change. So, you know, if you've been part of Calvary Chapel St. George for any length of time, um, you know the areas that the Lord's moved us to minister into, and one of them is along the Thai Burma border. This is a map of, of uh, Burma, also called Myanmar. And um, the map that's multicolored uh, highlights some of the different ethnic groups that live in Burma. Um, the big red area is the Korean people. The Korean people are uh, the largest of the ethnic minorities in Burma. The population is estimated between five and seven million people. The Korean language has over 20 dialects. And as I said, on the map, it's the larger red area. 75% of the Korean people are Buddhist, 20% are Christian, 5% are Muslim or animist. Many historians date the arrival of the Korean people to Burma 500 years BC, which predates actually the Burmese people. So they were actually there first. And why this is all important is because since World War II, there's been an ongoing civil war in Burma between the Burmese government and then the ethnic groups like the Korean people. There's other ethnic groups, there's the Rohingya and the Shan and the Kachin and the Korean. So there's numerous uh, ethnic groups, but Calvary Chapel St. George has been called to minister to the Korean. So since World War II, the governments used the military to attack the Korean people and the other groups. You know, slowly over the last decade, the last 10 years or so, things seem to be getting better. Just recently, earlier this year, some pro-democracy, pro-freedom uh, leaders were voted into office during the elections. Unfortunately, the outgoing leaders, they didn't like that. So they, there was a military coup that occurred in Feb on February 1st of this year. Just hours before the new leadership was to come into power, this coup occurred and they arrested many of the leaders. Uh, the lady who was, who was elected president, Aung San Suu Kyi, she was taken into jail along with thousands of other people. Since February in, in Burma, it's estimated over 7,600 people, innocent people have been arrested and over 1,300 people have been killed by the Burmese government. And again, these are just citizens. These aren't army men per se. These are just citizens of the country that the government, because they're not Buddhist or they're not Burmese, they want to wipe them out. So when the armies come, the people have a couple choices. They can stay and fight. Or they can flee. You know, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, the people, they don't have weapons or training. So fighting isn't a very effective choice. If a person does stay, decide to stay in the country, and just kind of hide from the military, 
run before them and hide in the jungle, that kind of stuff. They're called an IDP, an internally displaced person, IDP. So IDPs stay within their country. If they choose to go across the border for safety, any international border into Thailand, into Bangladesh, anywhere else, then they're called a refugee. So an IDP stays within the country, a refugee leaves the country. Most of the IDPs, because they're hiding from the military, they're in very difficult locations to get to, you know, up in the mountains and that kind of stuff. That's good for their safety, but it's bad for humanitarian aid to reach them. You know, it's much like if, the, if for some reason we were invaded and we had to all just run and flee out into the desert and start living out there. You know, what would our life look like? How would it be different than what it is right now that we know of? There's right now IDPs, as of December 31st, actually December 31st, 2020, it's estimated that there's 48 million internally displaced people in 59 countries around the world. 49, 48 million IDPs around the world. That's the largest number in the history of the world. And this is mainly just due to man's sin against man, man sinning against man. You know, just the, the stupidity, the sinfulness, the whatever that man has against their fellow man. So why are we there? You know, people ask us, how come you're along the Thai Burma border? Isn't there needy people in St. George? Isn't there needy people in America? Well, absolutely. And we, we try and reach their needs too. But this is a, the verse that God gave us to minister along the Thai Burma border. It's Psalms 82, verses 3 and 4. And in it, through Asaph, God says, to defend the poor and the fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy, free them from the hand of the wicked. So that's our heart, that's our desire at Calvary Chapel St. George, is to do that. To defend, to do justice, to deliver the afflicted. And one of the ways we accomplish this is through Chance for Change. Through our giving, through Chance for Change, through your giving, whether it's loose change that's in your pockets, as you walked in, you saw the sparklets bottles, whether it's loose change that you pop, just drop in there, or do folded dollar bills that you drop in there, or this year, Tyler made a QR uh, thing that you can scan with your camera. You younger people know what I'm talking about. They had to show me a QR thing that you scan with your phone, and it takes you to, on the internet to a place that you can give electronically. But whether you give that way, or whether you write a check and you put um, Chance for Change on a memo line, or whether you'd go online onto our website, calvarysg.com, and giving, and then click the drop-down menu, Chance for Change. 100% of the money is going to go to these ministries that, I'm going to, that we're going to talk about, that, that you're going to see tonight. And you're going to see the fruit of that tonight, hopefully, as if I do my job. So let's take a look at the ministries. The first one is a family home. You know, as, we've, as I described the plight of the Korean people, it's already pretty ugly by itself, but can you imagine if one of the children were handicapped? How much more difficult it would be? For the Korean families that have disabled children, you know, they have a much more difficult time. So in 2005, four Christian organizations got together to create the family home. It provides a loving, Christ-centered home for children with disabilities, HIV or other issues. Calvary Chapel St. George, you guys, you provide the finances to keep the, the children's the family home running, operational. So this photo that you see right now is a few years old. Many of the kids are grown and um, got on with life. Praise the Lord. You know, that's kind of the goal, isn't it, for all parents? To have your kids raised and leave the house? You know, so, but there's new generations coming in, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. This is Dodo. Dodo is the caregiver. She supervises the family home. She cares for the children, she arranges their scheduling, their medication, all that kind of stuff. Again, this is a little bit of an older photo of her and the, the young boy that she's with, Tot. He has cerebral palsy. Again, this is a few years old, this photo. Now Tot's actually grown, and he's living with his grandma. And his two brothers, uh, Ben and Nott, used to live in the family home with him. They're grown, and they, they go uh, work and provide money for a grandma to take care of Tot. One brother, Ben, we're, I'm going to show you a photo in a little bit. He's actually in college now. Again, both these photos are a couple years old. Uh, this is Kumfa and Bobo. 
Kumfa is Karin. He moved into the family home a few years ago. His parents are dead. His father is HIV positive, and he passed that disease on to Kumfa. Kumfa is not only HIV positive, but he has a heart condition. But you know what? He's doing well. Through Chance for Change, you know, we were able to purchase a medication, and he's, do, he's growing. I'm going to show you some pictures in a little bit of him you know, nowadays, and it's going to be a blessing to see how he's doing. Bobo is Burmese. She moved to the family home when she was three years old. Her parents had died, and no one was there to take care of her. One of her parents were HIV positive, but at this point, Bobo is healthy. She has three sisters and a brother in Burma that she, has, she knows nothing about. You know, her prayer is that one day she would be reunited with them, if they're even alive. But at this point, you know, there's no information. On the smaller, lower picture is a picture of four of the kids. You can see Kung Fa. He's in that green tank top and Bobo in the red shirt. In this picture, the, the group home had just received a Bible. You can see it sitting on the floor between them. They're going to share it, and just that's what they're going to do their Bible studies out of. This photo was taken, the, the photo above it, with them in a line, that was taken in 2015 by our missionaries, Palmer and Michelle. What they're doing in that, Palmer's there, you can kind of see his legs, and um, they're acting out the Bible story of Jesus calming the storm. You can see Bobo in the front, and behind her is Kumfa. And then the, behind, the, the bigger boy behind the, the kid in the blue shirt, that's Ben. And then his brother Tot is behind him. So this is just... This is all possible because of Chance for Change and just the, the support that that provides for these kids. You know, this photo is real old. Look how, look how tiny um, Bobo is standing in the front. She's got kind of like pink on her shorts. You know, that's, that's when she first moved into the, to the family home, and Kumfar is next to her. In the rear, you can see Palmer and Michelle. Palmer is a big guy, Michelle, his wife. And then just next to Palmer is Sharon Porterfield, her other missionary. Now, if, you be, if you're newer here, uh, you probably don't know this, but Palmer went to, be, went to go to be with the Lord in 2018. He was serving him along the Thai Burma border, and then he was called home from there. Michelle is still, she's in, currently in America because of the pandemic, but her heart is to go back and to continue the ministry there. So this is Bobo and Kumfar now. Praise the Lord, Holly, how big they are. You know, they're doing well. They're in, so you can see um, on the one photo, Bobo's wearing the red, red gown and uh, Kumfar's next to her in the blue. And you see another little girl there, that's Iris. This is the third generation coming in now to the family home. Um, you can see the, the photo of Bobo just doing uh, math on a computer because during the pandemic, school was closed. So they were doing their online studies. Up in the top corner, you can see him doing homework. And then in this kind of the center, there's a, there's a new boy. This, uh, this guy, his name um, is Podada. And he's lived at family home on and off for about eight years. His parents are in Burma, but if he lived with, them, if he lived with his family, what kind of education do you think he would get in a country that's torn and the people are running and hiding from the government? So he's at the family home. His, uh, his mother used to be a, a, a caregiver at the family home. So that's, that's, a, that's a correlation, that's a connection. He's currently in his sixth grade. And then the little girl, Iris, again, her, uh, her, her grandmother is Dodo. So it's not uncommon in Thailand, in the, in, along the Thai Burma border, that the grandparents take care of the grandkids while the parents are out working. So because Dodo's there, now Iris is kind of living there and just being raised up and learning the things of the Lord. So this next slide is Ben. That's Tot's brother. Remember I was telling you about him? Sharon Porterfield, our missionary right there, she met Ben unexpectedly uh, uh, last year or so. And she wrote in the update that she sends out. By the way, if you guys don't get the update from the missionaries out on the pod table, out in the, the corridor out there, there's a list you can sign up and you'll, you'll start receiving these updates from our workers. But in Sharon's update a, a year or so ago, she writes this. The Lord blessed me to see Ben, formerly at the family home. He's the big brother to Tot and Not, and he's in at the university now. He's doing very, very well. He wants to become an English teacher and he's going to church. 
So again, this is a fruit of chance for change. You know, these, these families that had absolutely nothing, devastation, even handicap issues, medica medical issues, were being blessed throughout the years. You remember in Psalms 82, God instructs us to do justice to, justice to the afflicted and the needy. To do justice, it means to do what's right and what's fair. In these photos of Bobo and Kumfar and Ben and the other kids at the family home, you can see how God's using us. He's using Calvary Chapel St. George through Chance for Change and through our prayers as we meet on prayer around the world to do justice to the afflicted and the needy. You can see how God's using us to deliver them from the hands of the wicked. And you can see, I hope, that the fruit of Chance for Change and how you're giving is just blessing these, these kids. So the next ministry is Pastor Edmund. Pastor Edmund and his wife, Pamuna, they're Corinne. Pastor Edmund's family, or his father, excuse me, was killed by the Burmese army. They live in a village called Klata, located in Thailand, along the Thai-Burma border. In the year 2000, Edmund moved the, uh, to this village, Klata, with a few families, and he started a church. The land was very cheap there because in that, that area, there was a graveyard. And so one of the predominant religions in uh, Thailand is animism. So the people believe that there are evil spirits because of the graveyard. So the land had no value. Well, Pastor Edmund and his, uh, the people with him, you know, they bought the land and they started a church. In 2008, the Korean Baptist Church was, re was registered in Thailand, and it's now birthed nine other churches. They outgrew the original church, so in December of 2018, they dedicated their new church building. The small photo you see is the old church taken by one of our youth. Before COVID, the volunteers at Pastor Edmund's Village, the Christians there, they received about 500 children every weekend. They taught them the Bible, they fed them, they played games with them, they loved on them. Most of the kids are from Buddhist families. But the parents wanted them to go to Edmund's Bible teachings because they saw a difference in the children who were taught the Bible. For many years before the COVID, when all the, board, the borders were open and travel was easy, we said for many years we sent our high school teams to go minister alongside Pastor Edmund, our youth. It was an annual event. Many of the workers we have out in the field, the younger workers, they've been to Pastor Edmund's camp and they learned ministry there. In Edmund's area, COVID's made these large group gatherings difficult. You know, you can imagine 500 kids from multiple villages. Sometimes the children would walk a couple miles just to go to the, the weekend event. So because of COVID, it, that all kind of got shut down. Since then, Pastor Edmund, through the Lord, just praying, he's found another way just to minister to the people. Since much of the economy in the area is based on tourism and tourism shot because of the pandemic, many of the parents, even in Thailand, the, the non-refugees are struggling to stay afloat. So you can imagine how more difficult it would be for the Korean parents. They're already refugees in a foreign country and they don't have the proper paperwork and everything. And now the pandemic comes. So the Lord, in part through Chance for Chain, is allowing Edmund's ministry to bring food, prayers, and hope to the people. You can see in these photos, um, the people receiving bags and bags of food. That's, some of this food is stuff that you guys purchased through Chance for Change to give to these people. This is just another photo of the same ministry just loading up and distributing the food in the areas. Pastor Edmund is also the senior chaplain for the Free Burma Rangers. Here he's baptizing a new believer with Dave Eubank. Pastor Edmund, in his ministry, he has three main objectives. Number one, to help rebuild the Korean churches. Number two, to teach the Bible to kids. And number three, to teach godly life skills to kids, things like disease and drug prevention. So that's, that's where his heart is. And then the third and final area of ministry that Chance for Chain provides for is the Malay, the Malay refugee dorms. 
So as of October of this year, in, Thai, in, in the Thai Burma area, there's 91,413 refugees. Remember, the definition of a refugee is somebody who leaves the country, an IDP stays in the country, a refugee leaves and goes across the, into another country. 91,413 refugees have had to fled, flee from the Burmese army. Not just this year, some, this has been going on for decades, but it has accentuated with the overflow, overflow, overthrow back in February. So, these 91,413 refugees, they live in nine refugee camps that are overseen by the United Nations. They're right along the Thai-Burma border. Most of the refugees, they're Korean or Karini. Through Chance for Chain, this church supports about 186 children. And I say about because it's difficult right now for, the, for our workers to get inside the camps because they're, they're barbed wire and all that kind of stuff. But because of COVID, they're, you know, they're really cracking down on visitors and that. So best guess is we support 186 children and 17 caregivers in the three dorms. The, the missions dorm has 42 children and four caregivers. The Timu Dra dorm has 51 children and five caregivers. And the IRC, or Internal Relief Committee dorm, has 93 children and eight caregivers. So they live in these camps. And the Lord uses us to provide food, shelter, medical care, education, Bible studies, basically everything they need to live. Because again, imagine what their lives would be in Burma. So for some of these kids, they're orphans. Their parents have been killed. Killed. For some of them, they're not orphans, but their, their parents realize, you know what? My son is not going to have an education. What are they going to become, you know, as I just run around in front of the, the Burmese army for the next five years? You know, so they choose to send them to these refugee camps where they can get, number one, safety, number two, food, and number three, education. We've been supporting these dorms for many, many, many years now the children in these dorms. Back in 2016, I had an opportunity to go with one of the youth groups, the, the high school youth groups, to the, the refugee camp. At that time, the United Nations had strict um, restrictions on taking photos. So I actually downloaded this photo from the internet, but this is exactly what it looked like. You can go to YouTube and type, on, type in Mela Refugee Camp, and you can watch videos of this place. You can, do, you know, you can see photos. You, there's all kinds of information. But this is a photo of walking down one of the main streets, the main pass. You notice how clean it is. At this time when I was there, or when this photo was taken, there was estimated between 40 and 45,000 people living in this one camp. You know, the people, they're given rations of food, but they also have gardens. They raise chickens and goats and other small animals to supplement their diet. In this photo, you can see the ladies, they weave, and then they have like a little store there selling some of their, it looks like dresses or things like that. Across the little path there, you can see a little restaurant type thing. So they're making a living, they're making the best of it, they're surviving. The problem is because of COVID, the relief, relief agencies that provide food for these refugees, they've taken a hit in their, their receiving of finances. They're struggling, support's dropped, so the amount of rations that the, the children getting are decreasing also. This is one of the residential areas, and it's one of the sleeping areas inside one of the dorms. You know, again, it's important to understand that parents send their children here because they hope to have a better life. You know, it's really no, nothing different than parents in America, right? Don't we all want better lives for our kids? You know, but for the Korean, this is what that looks like. So I want to introduce you to a few people. Out on our pot table out there, you're going to see a big binder full of stories like this. I just took photos of a couple of them, and I just want to share them to you, with you. This is Na, Na Plishoi. She wrote what I'm about to read when she was 18 years old. She says, my family are Buddhist. I have parents and four sisters. My parents stay in Korean State. They are farmers. They live in Kwele Village. Some time ago, the enemies come to our village and destroy it. My parents send me to camp to study. I want to become an interpreter. English grammar is a favorite subject in my studies. Singing and playing and studying makes me happy. 
This is Moody Sand. She's, she was 14 years old when she wrote this. Again, they wrote this. They're, they're learning English. They're learning the Bible. They're, they're learning. At the, when she wrote this, she had lived in a Timudra dorm for two years. She says, I lived in Burma. My family are poor. Burma soldiers come in my village and cause damage. Now we cannot go back. I remember my family in Burma have two sisters. I like to study English and play volleyball and football. I want to be a teacher. This is Sa Yen Pa. She wrote when she was 17 years old. She had been living in a dorm for a little over a year. She says, I have three sisters and no brothers. My father is a farmer. My mother is a teacher. I want to be a teacher too. I like science, English, geography, and math. During the time I live in Burma, I have many problems. The soldiers come and burn my house and my village. We have many problems with food, so I come to Thailand refugee camp. Burma's situation is very bad. It's kind of heartbreaking, isn't it? All these kids dealing with the repercussion of man's sin poured out on each other. You know, praise the Lord, that's not the end of this story. God's using us through Chance to Change to give these kids a hope and a chance for change. These photos were taken around Christmas time last year, 2020. In the large photo, you see the kids in the Timu Draw dorm receiving Christmas presents. You see a group of girls on a lower photo in the IRC dorm receiving hygiene kits. And most importantly, you see a girl being baptized ask, after asking Jesus to be her Lord and Savior. She now has eternal life, just like all of us, I hope. So I hope this blesses you to see how God's using you guys, this church, to not only provide for the physical needs of these hundreds of people, but also for the spiritual needs. He's using all of us here at Calvary Chapel St. George and other churches around the world to bring that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ to people around the world. And through Chance for Change, we go along the Thai Burma border and minister to these three groups, these three ministries. So now we want to pray for our missionaries. This is what it used to look like pre-COVID when we had pray around the world. Any of you old timers remember this? <laughs> So like I said, last month, the core group leaders did a wonderful job just sharing the different missionaries that we have and what their, their heart is for the people that God's called them to. So if you were here, I hope the Lord uh, just kind of put a twinge in your heart about wanting to go and just uh, sit in a circle for somebody, one of the, the missionaries, and pray with them, pray for them. Every circle, has, here at Calvary Chapel St. George, we pattern our uh, missions program after a book that's in a bookstore. It's called Serving Ascenders by Neil Perillo. It's in there if you want to purchase it. And every, every missionary has a core group leader and a core group, people that are kind of committed to just come alongside them and support them, either through prayer or communication or uh, logistics or finances. So that's what these circles represent. So in each circle, like I said earlier, this is a circle for the Thai Burma border. We have Sharon Porterfield and Pastor Edmund and Michelle and um, the Free Burma Rangers and Dorothy Kahn all represented in this circle. In the rear circle back over there is Mexico. We have a team heading to Mexico in just a few days to deliver uh, food boxes to 30 families of underprivileged people down in, in Mexico, Christians, church people. So that's represented back there. And also is Melody Misa and Caesar, who are from, the, Melody is from this church and she's serving at the Calvary Training Center. Back in that circle in that back corner is uh, Bryce and Bethany Hurd. They were the first missionaries that left Calvary Chapel St. George that were sent out from here back in the year 2000. Now uh, they have kids, the kids are growing. One's here in America in Bible college and um, yeah, they're doing well. But again, you know, this new virus strain, I was just looking at the headlines, it's starting to shut down England again. So, you know, do you think we ought to pray for Bryce for wisdom as he leads his church to this nether, next uh, surge? And then finally over here, North Africa, you know, the swimmers and the fishers. You guys know them. They've been here. You guys have spent, hopefully spent time with them. They're in a Muslim country, so we give them pseudonyms to pr pr protect their ministry. You think they need prayer in a Muslim country? Christians? Yeah, absolutely. 
So that's, that's the prayer circles. That's what we do here at Prayer Around the World. We pray for them. Each circle has a little sheet of paper that has a prayer request from the respective minist- uh, missionaries, and it's current. Like I said earlier, if you're not receiving the updates, sign, sign that form, the, the form out there on the, the paw table, and you'll get the entire thing. What's on the circles is just a little abbreviated uh, prayer request. Also, in some of the circles, you know, it's, it's important. When a missionary goes out in the field, they can, it's easy to get feeling like you're forgotten, like your home, home church does, forgets about. This is one reason we have this, prayer around the world. One of the things you'll see is I'll be taking photos, and I write an update and send to them so they can see people praying for them, so they can see people investing into their ministry that the Lord's called them to out in the field. But one of the things we want to do is remember their important days. So like in this circle... Sharon Porterfield, in the month of December, 36 years she's been, it'll be her ministry anniversary, she's been, she's been serving the Lord as a missionary to the Korean people, 36 years. Anybody want to sign that card and just bless her? Back over there in the, the Mexico circle, Melody, not only is it uh, her birthday, but it's her wedding anniversary next month. And then over there is, uh, in England, is Natalia Hurd. She's going to turn 16, Bryce and Bethany's daughter. You know, so we want to send a, fill out the card. So if you go to any of those circles, they're going to pass a clipboard around that has their um, birthday card on it. So please sign it. Write a little note. Hey, praying for you, love you, thank you, whatever. And they're also going to pass another clipboard for the core group. If, if the Lord just moves in your heart to become just a little more committed to sit in that circle, then sign up on the core group. And what that's important for is, number one, when the missionary comes back to America, we usually have a fellowship with them. Read that as food, a party, you know, and it's a, it gives a time for them to, to tell us on a personal level things that they can't just write in an update on a newsletter. But plus it blesses them when they see 20 or 30 people that are, want to come and hear them. You know, like I said, it's easy to think the church has forgotten you when you're out in the field. You know, so when they come back, we want to be a blessing to them. We want to be there for them. So signing up on the core group ensures that you'll get an invitation, if nothing else. So, so I think that's about it. Um, we're going to just go ahead and break. Um, we'll pray for it till maybe about a quarter after. And then Pastor Jerry is going to come up and close us out. Uh, we, as, I, as I mentioned, we have a team heading down to Mexico uh, Friday morning, early in the morning. So we want to pray for them. Okay. So you guys that are watching online, we're going to go ahead and shut down the service. If you were here Sunday, y'all have the prayer requests that were in your bulletin. So please pick those up and uh, you can just pray, pray through them. If not, we'll see you next Sunday, guys. So everybody, let's just uh, find a circle. We'll, we'll get in.